it's good to be back with you. And uh, it's good to see the Hope Clinic and uh, the report. And I want to thank you for all of the support you have given to the Hope Clinic. And um, thank you, Diane, and all of the people that have worked. Incidentally, we're going to have an open house right after the sermon. So please, uh, if you want to see it, please uh, go back there and see it. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, this morning, on this beautiful Sabbath day, we come to you. And Lord, we come to you like Jacob did at Jabbok. We don't want to let you go until you give us that blessing of your presence, your assurance, your Holy Spirit, your power, your truth in these last days. Please, Lord, bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. During the zenith of the Roman Empire, the demographics of the population was four slaves to one free person. Four slaves to one free person. As a result, the Romans had to enact strict, rigid laws in order to control the majority of the population, the slave population. There's one custom I want to share with you. Can we turn the projector on? Okay, thank you. There's one custom I want to share with you. When the master of the house sat down and he ate his food, if he took his napkin and just threw it down, disheveled, that indicated to the servant, I'm finished. I'm finished. You can come and take the plate, take the food, take the silverware, and, and I'm finished. But if the master took the napkin and folded it, folded it, and laid it on the table, that was the indication to the servant. I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. Don't, don't remove anything. Don't take anything away. Now it's interesting when Christ, maybe we can turn the lights low a little bit up front so you can see a little bit better. Can you see it, the contrast, the lighting? Okay. <clears throat> when Christ was resurrected, there are only two gospel writers that talk about the linen clothing around that wrapped his body. There's Luke and John. Matthew and Mark don't say a word about the wrappings of the body. And Luke says that when Peter walked into the tomb, he saw the linen cloths lying there, just lying there. But John, uh, John, who was also an eyewitness and is the last gospel to be chronologically written, says that when he came, he saw the linen cloths, but then he saw the face cloth, the face cloth folded separately. 
Now the question, was Christ trying to communicate something? Why would he do one and not the other? Well, you notice that the cloth that wrapped his mortal human body was thrown and it was disheveled. Basically, he was saying, I'm finished. I'm finished with that mortal body. But the face cloth that covered his glory, his mind, his purpose, he folded. Could he have been saying, I'm not finished yet? But now wait a second, wait a second, Pastor. Just a few days ago, Christ was on the cross. And when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, he said it is finished. There's something incongruent here. Well, let's take another look at the text. You'll notice that is found only in the Gospel of John. And John was there at the crucifixion and he heard it with his own ears. He's an eyewitness. Notice, and let's take a look at it in the context in the Greek so that we can have a better understanding of it. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, this is the New King James. The Greek word for the word accomplish in verse 28 is teleo, and it, 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 uh, it's translated accomplished, uh, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And then let's go down to verse 30. And so when he had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And the Greek word is teleo, again, teleo, again. And then he bowed his head, gave up his spirit. Taleo, if you look at the Strong's Analytical Concordance, you will find that Taleo means to pay up a debt. It's the final payment of a debt that you owe. And there's another Greek word propitiation, and it's only found in three places in the New Testament, and it means to satisfy a debt, to satisfy a debt. So basically, what Christ was doing when he said, it is finished, was saying, the debt is paid. Amen. What debt? What is he talking about? Well, Let's have an understanding of what happened at Calvary. Because unless you understand what happened at Calvary, you're gonna miss this. You have to make a distinction, a separation between the crucifixion and the sacrifice. The crucifixion is what man was doing to Christ. He was trying to kill Christ. The sacrifice is what Christ was doing for man. He was laying down his life. He was laying down his life. The Bible says that the Lord on him hath laid the iniquity of us all. All of our sins were placed on him. And it says, for by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. In 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul says, he became sin, who knew no sin. And in 1 John, it says that he is our propitiation, he is our satisfaction for our sins. And in Romans, it says, by one man's offense, all of us have reaped the negative consequences. But by one man's act, 
his act, singular. The free gift came to all men, resulting in justification. John, who is the eyewitness, says he was there at the cross, and when he was there at the cross, he saw when the centurion speared him and blood and water flowed out. Inspiration comments on these texts. It says in Desire of Ages that all of our iniquity was placed on him, was placed on him. And it separated him from God. He died, not just a physical death, he died the second death, a death of an unrepentant sinner for you and I. He took our place, he paid my debt. This separated him so much that it gave him intense anguish. So much so, 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 much so that he started having physiological symptoms. Now, around the heart, there's a pericardium sac. It's a double layer, and inside there's fluid. When Christ was on the cross, our sins were laid on him. He experienced such anguish, such separation from God, that his blood pressure started just rising, and the fluid started filling the pericardium sac, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, like you fill up a little balloon, and it burst, it ruptured. When it ruptured, the fluid in the pericardium sac flowed out with the water. Notice what inspiration says. The blood and the water that flowed from his side declared that he died of a broken heart, a ruptured heart. Physiologically, literally, he died of a broken heart. He was slain for the sin of the world. And the crucifixion deals primarily with justification. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. It's not by logic, and it's not by feeling. Notice what justification is. Justification is an act. It happens outside of you. It's an experience. It's a forensic act. It's a status. And it's your title to heaven. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as your savior, that moment your name is registered in the books of heaven as a child of God, a son and a daughter of God, and you're adopted into the family of God. And you stand before God as if you had never sinned. That's justification. Well, now you say, wait a second, wait a second. Come on now, that's not logical. Everybody knows I'm a sinner. Hey, hey, hey. That's true. Martin Luther said, simul justus et peccado. We are simultaneously just, justified, and yet empirically a sinner. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. We're justified because of what Christ did at the cross. He paid the price. He is our propitiation. But he's not finished yet. He's not finished yet. After Christ died, he ascended and went to the heavens. When he went to the heavens, he went to sit at the right hand of God. At the right hand of God, he is our advocate, our mediator. Notice, who brings, again, who brings the charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it that condemns? It is Christ who died the second death. He's our propitiation. And furthermore, he's risen and he stands at the right hand of God and he makes intercession for us. When Stephen was being stoned, the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked up into the heavens. 
And lo and behold, he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He sees it with his own eyes. He sees Jesus Christ as our high priest, as our intercessor, as our mediator, as our advocate. He is on our side. Now, when I was younger, I used to think, unfortunately, that, you know, maybe God the Father was a little rigid. He was a little stern. He was exacting and demanding. That's, you know, I grew up with that and, and I thought Christ was pleading to the Father in my behalf because the Father said, justice, justice, justice. Christ said, mercy, 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 grace, grace, grace. And I thought, you know, between God the Father and Jesus, they're having it out, you know? And Christ is my advocate. Well, how mistaken I was. Notice in John 16, Christ is talking to his disciples, and you can find this in many translations. The Weymouth has it, the Goodspeed has it, the NIV has it. He's talking to the disciples and he says, and that day you will ask of me. And I do not say that I will intercede with the Father. I'm not gonna intercede with the Father because the Father loves you anyway. The Father loves you. I don't have to intercede for you. He loves you, he's on your side. He's on your side. Now when you stop and think about this, you think about Christ as our high priest. One of the best examples is in Zechariah. Zechariah 3, verses 1 through 5. You remember when the high priest, Joshua, stands before the angel of the Lord, which is Christ. And who is the one that's accusing? Satan, the devil, the great adversary. He is standing at my side, accusing me, reminding me of all of my sins, all of the times I've failed, all of my inconsistencies, all of my uh, regrets. And you know what? That's about the only time that the devil is telling the truth. When the devil points out my sins, he's telling the truth. I am a sinner. I'm a sinner. Now you know, if you look at that, what happens? What do I say? Oh, well, 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 let me defend myself. No, 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 I just keep quiet. And I let my advocate, my lawyer, do the talking. And what does he say? The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. The Lord rebuke thee. Is not this a brand pluck, plucked out of the fire? And then he says, take away his filthy garments. Put clothes on him. The righteousness of Christ covers us. Now, there's something I want you to note because it's not said in this passage of Scripture, but it's vital. What is the high priest doing? What is he saying? What does he say when Satan accuses him? He says nothing. He knows he's guilty. But what is he doing? Remember, he's standing before the angel of the Lord. When you're standing in front of anybody, where's your field of vision? Where's your field of vision? It's in front of you, right? You're looking right at Jesus. You're keeping your focus on Jesus. Remember, it's the look that justifies and the gaze that sanctifies. Keep your eyes on Jesus. 
keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, when uh, you look at what he has done, uh, we have a high priest and he sympathizes with us, he knows us, he feels with us, and he's able to save to the uttermost. There's nothing, nothing in your life that God cannot deliver you from. Nothing, I don't care how bad it is, he can deliver you, he can deliver you. Christ as our high priest is dealing with our sanctification. I mean justification, sanctification. And it's a lifetime process, it's an experience. It's something that happens in us and it is our fitness for heaven. The cross deals with justification. His high priesthood deals with sanctification. Now you find what happened with Christ in two books of the Bible, the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation. I've often, often asked the question, which is more important, Christ's death or Christ's ministry as the high priest? What do you think? Which is the most important thing? Well, they're both important. They're essential. Notice, inspiration. It says, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential, vital, to the plan of redemption as his death on the cross. By his death, he began. He began. He didn't finish. He began what he was after to uh, complete after he ascended. And uh, by, by that, God, Christ opened the gate to the Father's throne. I say there are two books that deal with Christ's ministry, the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation. You know, there's been a lot of theological controversy. Martin Luther, when he translated the Bible into German, he said there were four books of the Bible that he did not consider inspired. There was the book of James, the book of Jude, the book of Hebrews, and the book of Revelation. He said you can't see Christ in the book of Revelation. Oh man, I don't understand how he came to that conclusion. But nevertheless, that's what Martin Luther believed. And so as a result, he did not consider those books as inspired as the others, Romans, Galatians, and so on. And as a result, his gospel was more emphasizing justification, and rightly so. At the time, they probably needed that more than anything else. But now we have to look at the whole Bible, and we need to get the total picture and see it in its dimension. But in the book of Revelation, you have Christ in the sanctuary, and it's like pulling a veil, and you're seeing behind the scenes him working out his plans, his purposes, silently and persistently. You notice in Revelation 1, Christ is walking among the candlesticks. And that's in the holy place. And then, of course, you have Revelation 10. Revelation 10 is an interesting prophecy. It's about the angel that has one foot on the land and one foot on the water. He takes the little book, he eats it. It's sweet in the mouth and bitter in the belly. And those of you who have went, who have gone to the general conference know that Pastor Ng talked about that the first Sabbath of the general conference. It deals primarily with a great disappointment. And they were bewildered. They didn't know why Christ didn't come on October 22, 1844, like they had preached it. Well, what happened, he went to the most holy place. After chapter 10, you have chapter 11. And on chapter 11, it says that the temple of God was opened in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant, that's the mo where the most holy place is, was seen. And there was lightning, noises, 
thunders, earthquake, and great hail. When Christ moves to the most holy place, there's movement. There's movement. You know it. There is a statement in the book of Revelation that's mentioned 42 times, a voice from heaven. And you see that Christ is in heaven orchestrating the events of this earth. He's orchestrating the events of this earth to bring people into maturity and spirituality. Now, there is one prophecy that is mentioned in the books of Daniel and Revelation seven times. And that's the prophecy of the 1,260 days. And it's mentioned in different ways. It's mentioned 1,260 days. It's mentioned 42 months. It's mentioned times, times, and the dividing of time. And I think the reason why God did that is because he doesn't want you to miss it. He doesn't want you to miss it. If you look in Daniel and Revelation, you'll see the prophecy of the little horn in Daniel 7. You'll see the prophecy of the first beast that comes out of the water in Revelation 13, and the scarlet woman in Revelation 17. Now, if you study it, you'll find that there are 16 characteristics that identify who is this. And I believe, based on scripture, and based on what the Bible teaches, that it is none other than the papal system. I wanna be very, very careful. So hear me carefully. I'm not talking about personalities. I have family. I have family, lovely people friends, lovely people, genuine Christians that, you know, don't believe the way I do. I'm talking about a system, an institution, a theological interpretation. I believe it's the papal system. Now, there's something that happened in May, May 24th. On May 24th, 2015, Pope Francis wrote an encyclical, Laudato Si, praise be to you. And he's talking about praising Mother Earth, praising Mother Earth. And in that encyclical, Laudato Si, he's dealing with global warming. Now, <laughs> I know that's a political debate, and I know people, people, you know, discuss this, and some agree, some disagree, but he wrote an encyclical. And in that encyclical, which is 193 pages, 246 paragraphs, each paragraph has a number, in this encyclical, in paragraph three, he says, I am writing this to every living person on this planet. Are you a living person on this planet? Okay, he's writing it to you. This encyclical is for you, okay? It's for you. It's not for a certain group in a certain religious affiliation. It's for every single individual living on this planet. And he goes on. Paragraph 68, he says, well, first of all, he's talking about, if, if you don't, if, if you get a chance, look it up and read it. It's less than 200 pages. He talks about the socio-economic impact of global warming. 
He talks about the scientific impact of global warming, the sociological impact of global warming, and he deals with that issue from multiple perspectives. And then, it's basically a two-fold outline, problem, solution. And he's building up his case. In paragraph 68, he says, rest on the seventh day is meant not only for human beings, but the ox, the donkey, also need rest. Then in paragraph 71, 71, he talks very clearly. He says, the biblical tradition clearly, clearly shows that this, th this renewal entails recovering and respecting the rhythms of nature by the hand of the Creator. And then he says, for example, the law of the Sabbaths. And then he talks about the seventh day Sabbath. And you notice in that uh, each seventh day was a day of rest, the Sabbath. And he gives the Bible verses, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. And then he talks about the sabbatical Sabbaths every seventh year. And he also gives, he also gives Bible verses for that. And then he talks of the seven weeks of years, the year of Jubilee, the 50th year. And he gives he gives Bible references. This is paragraph 71, and he's say, saying, in nature, there is a rhythm, and this rhythm was brought about by the hand of God. It's a law of the Sabbath, and he gives scripture. He gives scripture, and he's setting a precedent. He's building a case where you need to rest the land you need to take care of God's creation. That's, he starts out with. But then, towards the end, in chapter five, he deals with the solutions. He deals with what are the ways to rectify the problem of global warming. And this is paragraph 237. He says, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant as a day to heal our relationships with God, with ourselves, others, and the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. It proclaims man's eternal rest in God. I want you to note, Paragraph 71, he states the law of the Sabbath, but he gives biblical documentation. Paragraph 237, he says that Sunday is, is uh, the day that is important. And notice his footnote, 168, that's the catechism. He doesn't quote the Bible or give you a Bible verse. But you notice, he called it a Jewish Sabbath. A Jewish Sabbath. First of all, when was the Sabbath instituted? At creation, right? Before the Jews even came on the scene, the Sabbath existed. And it was kept throughout the Old Testament, kept throughout the New Testament. Even Christ said the Sabbath was made for man, for man. But in 363, 364, there was a council, a council of Laodicea. In that council, they dealt with about 60 issues, 60 issues. And one of them, well, all of the issues they called canons. In Canon 29, they voted, this church council voted, the outlawing of the keeping of the Jewish Sabbath. They, they think the seventh day, Saturday, is a Jewish Sabbath, and they encourage the rest on the Lord's Day, Sunday. And then, Canon 59, it forbade the reading of uncanonical books 
books that are not approved of the church. And then in Canon 60, it lists the books that are approved of the church in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, it said there were only 26 books because it omitted the book of Revelation. Now, don't believe anything I say. Check it out yourself. Check it out yourself. Read the encyclical. Go to history. Read what happened in, in, in there, in the Council of Laodicea. Now, in this encyclical, you'll notice that it's mentioned, the word city, 29 times. Right after Pope Francis I had wrote his encyclical, he called all the governors and mayors of the world, in the United States, in Europe, in Africa, all over, uh, all over. And um, he wanted to go over the global warming. Why is it so important? Because the majority of the population of the world lives in cities by 2030. Over 60% will live in cities. And it will generate 85% of the gross domestic product and around three quarters of the world's energy-related greenhouse gases emissions. Among those who were present was the governor of California, Jerry Brown, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio, Boston Mayor Marty Welch, New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrau, and many, many others. Many others. And after Pope Francis gave the summit and the recommendations, he asked them to sign a commitment to join him, join him, and influence others in the global warming issue. Now remember, he's a good evangelist. He's a good evangelist. Make a commitment. And as you know, Pope Francis will be coming to the United States September 22 to September 27th. He's going to go to three places, Washington, D.C., New York City, and Philadelphia. I want you to notice something, though. Notice something. The Pope arrives in Washington, D.C., September 22. September 23 starts the year of Jubilee. That's the year when all the captives are set free. That's the year when all the land is freed. And it starts the year of Jubilee, and it is the 70th year of Jubilee in history. The Pope speaks September 24th to the joint session of Congress. That's the first time in history that a pope has addressed the joint session of Congress. First time in history. And then he speaks to the UN the next day. The pope has addressed, other popes have addressed it three other times, so this is the fourth time. And then he leaves September 27th and this is the blood moon, the fourth blood moon, it's a super moon. And at sundown on the 27th, it starts the Feast of Tabernacles. I know there's a lot of evangelical preachers preaching about the four blood moons. And I'm not so sure what the significance of all the theology is, but I do know that the Bible says there will be signs in the heavens. Now, when you look at this, you ask yourself the question, the Pope already expressed his mission, already expressed his position, already expressed his solution. And I wouldn't be surprised, I wouldn't be surprised, and I say this carefully, humbly, if he doesn't urge some of his solutions onto some of the leaders in our Congress, some of the leaders in the world to enact 
laws that put things into practice. Now you say, well, we've had Sunday laws for a long time. Yes, we have. 29 of the 50 states in the United States already have Sunday blue laws. 29. In Massachusetts, there's one that has a day of rest clause. A day of rest clause. That's one of the solutions that I think will probably be coming, and I believe that because I believe in prophecy. But there's something sobering. Inspiration tells us that the United States has been a favored people. We've been blessed. We've been blessed. God has blessed us. But when we do things that are incongruent with the law of God, when there is a national Sunday law, inspiration says national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. The result of that national apostasy will be national ruin. There's going to be traumatic, traumatic events. The Bible calls it a time of great tribulation. There's going to be a great tribulation. Many things are going to close and many things are going to open up. But I want to tell you something that is deep within my core. And one of the reasons why, when I was younger, I went to medical school to study medicine and why I believe in the Hope Clinic. <laughs> and why I believe in reaching out to people and helping the sick and the needy and the suffering who are in pain and suffering because inspiration tells us that in the last days when all this tribulation, all the hardship, things are going to be closed. But there's one thing that we'll be able to do, and that's medical ministries. Medical ministries. Don't ever lose your vision when it comes to what God has ordained. Because it's important. I have a cousin. His name is Louis Torres. Louis is the president of the Guam Mission Conference. He worked with Amazing Facts. He was an evangelist. And he tells me, you know, Tony, I can't go to these islands and preach evangelistic sermons. They won't allow me. But I can go with medical work and they'll open their arms to me because I'm helping people. I'm sharing the love of Christ to them. And it's like Diane showed in her slide. Augustine once made the statement, preach the gospel always and sometimes use words. It's how you live. It's how you live. That's important. And Christ is waiting. He's waiting for us to represent his character, to be perfectly reproduced. Now, there are two places in the Bible that talks about it is done. The first is in Revelation 16. That's in the seven last plagues. That occurs right after the close of probation. And then in Revelation 19, Christ comes with all of his glory, with all of his angels riding on a white horse. He's king of kings and lord of all lords. And at that time, there is a resurrection. We're going to have new bodies. We're going to be glorified. That's going to be a beautiful, beautiful event. And then the next time he says it is done is in Revelation 21 when the holy city comes down. And when it comes down, Eden 
will be restored. I want you to note the process. The crucifixion deals with justification. Our high priesthood deals with sanctification. The second coming deals with glorification and the resurrection, and the third coming deals with the new earth. It's going to be restored back to the way it was. And we know that whatever we're going through, God has a plan and God has a purpose for us. And he foreknew us and he predestined us to be conformed into his image. And who he predestined, he called. Who he called? He justified, and who he justifies, he glorifies, and you can be confident in one thing. God isn't going to give up on you. God, you know, we talk about unconditional love. God doesn't have conditional love. God loves you unfailingly. He doesn't give up on you, and he won't give up on you. He is tenacious. He will hold on to you until he sees you face to face, and you can have that hope, you can have that anchor, because it's sure and stolid. And one day, we're all going to recognize that fact, and the great controversy, all this stuff is going to be ended. There's going to be harmony, there's going to be peace, there's going to be joy, there's going to be fulfillment, we're going to have new bodies, Oh, we're going to be with our loved ones. I tell you, words cannot even begin to describe. Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard what God has for his people. I tell you, it's exciting. It's exciting.